Mr. Calvin Lee, Deputy Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture and Information, officials of the FRC, officials of the schools, officials of the library, offers, members of the research committee, the 2016 Jacmel Jeune Coyol committee members, sponsors, members of the media, members of the public, both here and online, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Indeed, I must say, today is absol absolutely a joyous occasion. In preparing for today, I was searching for one of Derek Walcott's poem, one which speaks about the Rosso Valley. But in doing so, I tumble upon one of his poems entitled, Love After Love. And the first paragraph reads, the time will come when with elation you will greet yourself arriving at your door in your mirror and each will smile at the other's welcome. I'm not sure how those of you who are here today feel, but for me, the time has come, which is today. At this moment, as we launch this book, as this story begins to unfold, to the world, I feel very much elated. I feel that I have arrived at telling the story of Jean Ozo. I know that I am a proud product of the Rosso Valley, and there are others among us who also are. For quite some time, I have been saying, and that is my belief, which is very difficult to eradicate from my mind. That I, along with others, have been malici maliciously vindicated simply because our address was Rosso. Rosso being viewed as Negmao. In the beginning, I didn't clearly understand the meaning of Negmao. But because of the love that I have developed over the years for books, reading, and writing, I got to read the book entitled Negmao Freedom Fighters by Michael Obertin. And now I don't mind being a Negmao. Yeah. <laughs> Looking back at the project, for the past eight years, I was in conversation with Primus and Patrice. And I told them that this is an unfinished project because there is a lot more to be written about the Rosso Valley, especially in the glory days of the Rosso Valley. Ladies and gentlemen, let us today each smile at the other's welcome. Today, we have been able to tell the stories of the Rosso Valley. Now, both I and those of you from the Rosso Valley can proudly say that I am from the Rosso Valley. I have no difficulty in saying that me, c'est Jean Ozo. In the words of Derek Walcott from his poem, Iona, Paul on Ozo, Mwetan Akon Kone. With that, I want to welcome each and every one of you to the Rosso Valley. The conch shell has been blown. Sit, fist, and listen to the journey of a people as we today launch Stories of the Rosso Valley. Welcome, enjoy. There and everywhere, it's an auspicious occasion when we are celebrating Jean Ozo um, on a very important weekend when we are also celebrating the achievements of another young St. Lucian in the name of Julian Alfred who has done what we all know she has done. What the world doesn't know and we are telling them today is that a people, a community, 
who has been written and spoken about historically, eventually decided to tell their own story. And this publication, while it is an eight-year-old work, it comprises in 185 pages and 14 chapters different stories of the same community coming from the mouths of the people looking into the mirror and sharing with us the histories that have been orally embedded in their heads. Exagen was offered who met a livre sala ensemble. C'est un grand contribution qui nous caille voulait cette lycéen et toute l'autre commune Apan, listen on ki wozoka passage jodia. Because this book, while written by certain contributors, the effort of putting it together, of taking us from the 2016 Junior Creole activity in Jacmel to the 2024 launch of the stories of Roseau Valley is, like I said, a long trip. And the contributors, all except one, um, are here today. And we start with Primus Hutchinson, who has written the most chapters, um, not only because he's from the area, but also because he's somebody like me who likes to write and talk. And um, Primus is a journalist um, specialized in queer language, as we all know, and people are still surprised when they hear him speak English. <laughs> but he's had uh, close to 40 years experience in broadcast journalism, a former employee of Government Information Service and Radio St. Lucia, and he, uh, Patrice and um, Stanislas participated in an interview about this project, which is online on NTN and GIS and is being circulated and can be followed. Um, Patrice, who is the chairperson here and the um, general manager of everything that has been happening to ensure we get where we are, uh, she was the Miss Ancillary in uh, 2008. She's also the Vice President of the Monciso Boiden Mondo Jackmel Development Committee. And she's president, president of the Jackmel uh, Jeune Creole Committee and a public servant. This is just a minuscule bit about uh, Patrice. When you pick this up and you go through it, we need to uh, give her the recognition for the various contributions that she has made. Stanislas Albert, whom we just heard, is president of the Monsizo Boiden Mondo Jacmel Development Committee, a police officer by profession, and has held several leadership roles, including scouting. But uh, from a Boy Scout to a man police officer it was just one transition. And he has reminded us that after reading uh, Neg Mao, and those of you who haven't read it, uh, by the mighty mighty, um, you need to get that feeling that he got growing up being ashamed of being called Jean Ozo and Neg Mao, but after having read what a St. Lucian wrote about how we should interpret Neg Maon. He is proud, like he said, to be called a Neg Maon. A round of applause for <laughs> Istanbul's loss as well. Um, Margaret Lubin Aoki is not with us, she's in Japan, but um, she made a significant contribution as well. Um, she's a former community development officer, chair of the Roseau Valley Global Network and she resides in Tokyo, uh, Japan. And uh, throughout um, our work, particularly and including in the days of this week, we have been in touch with her. And from all the way over in Tokyo, she has been 
and made contributions that have been incorporated today. She will be glad to hear if she's following. And we want to have a round of applause for uh, Margaret Ludin Akoy. Another person not here but represented and who we will hear from later is Mr. Francis Leons, who long, much earlier than eight years ago, um, met me somewhere on Jeremy Street. And um, I think I was still at the Star as editor of the Star. And we got into a conversation which ended with him pointing out that he thought there was a need uh, for the real history of the Roseau Valley to be documented. And he, I thought at the time, which is um, still very much true, was one who could have contributed significantly. And while he's not here with us, like with Patrice, every single thing that is contained in here and every single thing that has been done and discussed and approved has gone through that committee which Mr. Leos has attended every single meeting of up to last night. Another round of applause for Mr. Francis Leos. Father Lambert Sanchez is a Catholic priest, a poet and novelist, author of two collections of poetry, one called Helen and her sister Haiti, and the other called Our Father, Prayer and Praxis, along with a novel called In Turbulent Waters. And he conceived, supervised the building of and brought to completion the existing Holy Family Church in Roseau Jacmel during his tenure as parish, pre parish priest there. And while he might no longer be the parish priest, the number of persons I've seen come up um, to shake hands as if um, that was an automatic transmission of blessings, um, he is still, <laughs> he is still um, in many persons' hearts, the parish priest they grew up with. A round of applause for the Father Central. <laughs> Last but by no means least, Brian Ogis is the principal of the, or was the principal of the Rosso RC Combined School from 1982 to 1992. Uh, he's described there as a motivational speaker, a humorist, and evangelist. His several publications, including Pray Through Your Dungeons, Succeeding Against All Odds, A Practical Guide to Success in Examinations, Anxious About Nothing, Secret Prayers of Job, His Deliverance, God's Nobel Laureate. Let's have a round of applause for Mr. Brian Ogie. And that was about the authors, but what they wrote is compiled here, and I can guarantee you that after reading this, you will want to identify with Jean Wozu. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, indicate that this ceremony is a very, very unique one and it's taking place during the week of emancipation and uh, obviously is an event that must be recognized both nationally and internationally. Emancipation uh, must be regarded not as a single event, but as a process that takes a very, very long time to fruition. And this exercise today, as well as the exercise of publishing the book, is part and parcel of that uh, emancipation process. Uh, the Emancipation Act that was done by the British government has been recognized by a lot of intellectuals as the, and lawyers as the worst act that was ever passed by a government because it was given artificial uh, artificiality, really, to the question of the freedom of the slaves. 
but was mostly uh, for the benefit of the slave owners and not the actual workers. And it was also vicious in the sense that there was a continuity after the Emancipation Act itself because the laws were erected or sued to further suppress the slaves so that they had a very, very high time for their freedom. And so the process of freedom continued. And that is why, that is why we have the Jean Rousseau concept. It is because of the specific laws, they were passed laws against the workers. So this book, of which I wrote the forward, and which I will do with what I wrote in the forward, and I say, when this, when one considers that Jean Rousseau were widely considered to be the most ignorant, uncivilized, illiterate, and backward people of Sardinia. This bold attempt by the present generation of the people of the area, led by Primus Hutchinson, to document their history for posterity, should be considered admirably admirable and must be graciously complimented and applauded by all of us. Although William Mutter, the then owner of Rosewood Estate, started the first and only estate school in Tanisha in 1836, it was not until 1955 120 years after emancipation that the educational authorities assigned a qualified teacher called Jones Jabatis to initiate a school in the Rosso Valley. The embryonic school was a little room and after years it evolved into what is now known as the Rosso Combined School. When educational improvement occurred in the valley, the valley was lucky in that it got Irene Dujon, who came from the valley as the first principal of the Marigo uh, School. And that was a big achievement for the people of Rosa. The major part of the his history are the accounts given by Hutchinson, Stanislas um, Albert, and Patricia Nyanel on the social, economic, and religious aspects of the valley is well documented. Attention must be drawn to certain enlightened features of particular significance is the historical, the living history I describe it as, of uh, Sir Dunstan Sintoma, of the mural of the church uh, at Jackmel. In that regard, Father Lambert St. Rose's contribution is both illuminating and worthy of note. An unexpected sequence, consequence rather, of this masterpiece work is the elevation of Roseau Valley to national position as an authentic, creative, indigenous, touristic uh, uh, attraction. 
Francis Leos's contribution, focusing specifically on the agricultural life of Roseau, is well documented and worthy of serious consideration by the socio-economic policy makers on the future national agricultural development of St. Lucia. The model farm's experience in particular clearly indicates that St. Lucia was able to be competitive with Central American bananas as the Roseau Valley uh, uh, farmers got up to 15 to 20 tons per acre, which was a very, very high productivity levels. In addition, Leos teaches several useful lessons in land use, land reform, and agricultural technology and practices in respect of building resili resilience for future climate change challenges. Further, the Roseau Valley well earned but little and hardly acknowledged international reputation developed from banana research in the Roseau Valley gave lessons not only to St. Lucia but throughout the banana growing world. So in fact, uh, Roseau was the crucible of agricultural development as far as banana cultivation and technology is concerned throughout the world. Uh, and of course, um, one of the contributors to that just died, Dr. Ed C. Edmonds. And I think that uh, uh, Ms. Leos is going to say something about him. But there was a tremendous amount of work that was done there. It is heartening, however, to make the rapidly increasing number of professionals that came out from the Roseau Valley. Of these, the pioneering work of Joan Dujon of Algas Organics, which continues to gain him and St. Lucia international attention, is also worthy of special praise. It is hoped that this particular effort by the community will catalyze more community-oriented historical document documentation of today and tomorrow for the sake of the future of benefit of us all. The recent developments that have occurred by, and documented by, by Patrice are very, very, very illuminating and should be studied in detail. Of course, we have to give tremendous praise to the committee because the committee labored for about eight years trying to do that. The dedication and the spirit, you can see the spirit of cooperation as illustrated in the front of the book, which lists the contributors, the main contributors, which had been dealt with uh, by Mr. Earl Buski. But it shows a kind of ancestral spirit of Kutme, if you want to call it, because of the continuity of bringing what happened into the thing, but cooperatively by those members of the community. And it also shows, of course, the improvement in self-confidence, self-reliance, determination, self-determination. So the spirit, the real spirit of freedom is coming out from that work that those people have done. And this must be recognized nationally. The, 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 the thesis of the main theme, really, is one of real I describe as hope uh, for the future. And uh, it's really showing the, spirit, the fighting spirit of the ancestors being uh, imbibed and being expressed by the current uh, authors. Now, I like to describe the book, that is my own term, as, as 
a Mirabile Dictu book, uh, being a colonial educator, if you want to call it, getting my education like a worker. Mirabile Dictu is the Latin for a wonderful story to relate. So this is a Mirabile Dictu story, a wonderful story. But I would say that this, and somebody mentioned it, that it is incomplete story. It is not a full-fledged story of the valley. There are certain, and if I may make, having read it and done the, 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 um, the, the forward, some constructive criticisms, constructive criticisms of the book, which I believe should be utilized for enhancement of further editions of the book. In other words, your task has just begun. Uh, the, the, there are a lot of insights provided by what you have done, and there are a lot of lessons to be learned nationally uh, from that. The old and both old and new challenges as they relate to climate change and so on, much more has to be delved into. There is need, for example, to give a greater input to certain of the periphery areas uh, of, of the area, places like Dorado, Millet, etc., etc. Mention was made in the book about two individuals, Stephen Hippolyt and Stanislaus Matthew, just in cursory. These gentlemen were from Millet and were in charge of what was known of these friendly societies. And the friendlies, they worked the friendly societies for the area, which was very significant because basically the friendly societies was the old NIS, if you want to call it that. And that, I think, is something that needs to be captured again in your further uh, elaboration of, of, this, of this book. The other thing is that the... Um, the question of the transport system mentioned was made, uh, was it um, Lilburn who went through uh, Never Die or something like that? Never Fail, Never fail. yes. Uh, but there were some others, especially the, 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 the Matthew family um, from, from the Millet, the, the Vanna side and so on which I think should be uh, 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 incorporated in further editions. Then there is the influence of the Roseau Dam and its contribution to the survival of the north of the country. We have to recognize that as well. Uh, it's not a it's not it's not a, a, a simple matter that Roseau has contributed significantly to all the things that the fellows in Castries are enjoying because it was the most banana money, right? That made the contributions for the development of the roads, so on and so on. And now you have the water supply uh, coming um, from Roseau. So this I think should be captured. There were also people from Roseau who made contributions to castries, the, the, the commercial side in castries, just like, for example, um, you had the Judas and so on from Ansari and so on. There were the Kuda Bacchuses from Roseau that had their business in castries, and that should be true. The most important, one of the most important aspects of this also is the recognition, there were recognition of some people, but I 
during my, my research, there was a significant gentleman by the name of Cyril Matthew, who happened to be my boss, and who made one of the most significant contributions to the development of the banana industry in St. Lucia, straight from Roseau, from Millet. And I want to illustrate this by an article in the voice of St. Lucia, all right? Which says, Cyril Matthew, an outstanding soil of St. Lucia, straight from the Roseau Valley. And so this has to be reinserted and incorporated in the new edition uh, when it comes in. So Patrish, um, Patrish, um, um, Stanislas, you ought to take note of these uh, uh, additions. Now, finally, Roseau Valley, the lesson, the lesson that comes out from this, and Mr. Leon had said he'd made a, 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 a revisiting of the valley after 20 years, and he found that the valley was still agricultural, which is significant, because the best soils that you have for Roseau. So if I were the Prime Minister of St. Lucia, and I got this book, the first thing that I would do was to ensure that Roseau would solve the problem of food security in the nation. We need to re bring back or, re or resurrect the Roseau uh, research station that was there and the 30 acres that these have been doing for the agricultural development of the country. And we need, again, and then your men mention, mention of that person, but you didn't uh, develop it. We need to do that in the next edition of Christopher Cox, who I consider, because I was the, I was the head of agricultural research in the whole Caribbean, and I've gone through the whole Caribbean farmers and so on, and I consider Christopher Cox from the Roseau Valley, right, from Vana, to be the best middle-class farmer in the Caribbean. And so you have examples, you have examples of issues arising from that book that has to be put into the national uh, agenda. Finally, uh, since we are, um, uh, uh, since we are uh, in St. Lucia Distilleries, and since we are, and since we are uh, celebrating Juju's uh, uh, triumph, I want to suggest that the industrialization of this area, which is to this side of the Roseau Valley, be continued, and that St. Lucia distilleries consider the erection of an agro-industrial complex that would take care of all our wild mangoes and so on, and preserving them, and so on, all right? And our fruits, and that you could probably, when that new agro-industrial complex comes in, you will, of course, utilize the fruits and so on to make two specialities that will bring money to the world and to St. Lucia, to, I mean to St. Lucia. One is Juju Gold. <laughs> which would take things like mango and uh, passion fruit juice, incorporated if you distill your liquor down here. That's the gold. And juju silver, which will take more things like sour soap and things like that. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Good afternoon, everyone. Bon après-midi, tout le monde. J'ai aussi bon après-midi. Pas moi. Ok. I wish to seek your permission to adopt uh, the protocol already established. However, I wish to preface my contribution with a few acknowledgements. I beg your indulgence. Two gentlemen present here today who have impacted my professional life very positively. Therefore, I feel obligated to use this platform to express my sincere appreciation and gratitude. Mr. Jerry George. who paved the way for me to navigate a very rugged path by providing basic training in the field of broadcasting, making it possible to grasp the rudiments of particularly radio broadcasting. I am very grateful to have been one of many who profited, who profited from his selfless and altruistic qualities. Mr. Matthew Roberts. While Jerry paved the way, Matthew Robert, who was at the time the principal information officer at the Government Information Service, the GIS, saw to it that I entered the gate which led to my broadcast journalism career. He personally saw to it that I became part of the GIS team, and the rest is history. Previously, however, there were very humiliating experiences the stigma of Jawuzu followed me everywhere. And like the mighty shadow, I was seriously contemplating moving to the hills. But unlike the shadow, planning to plant peas in Tobago, uh, my aim was not focused on legumes at all. However, I'm very thankful very thankful to Mr. Jerry George and Mr. Matthew Roberts. Thank you so much, sirs. Thank you. My task here today is an attempt to take you on a journey through the book, through this book, using a shortcut route. However, the attention really is to endeavor to pick your curiosity long enough to feel very guilty living the ceremony without purchasing a copy. In the foreword to the book, Sir Calix George aptly and succinctly captured the essence of the stories of Rosal, enticing the reader and in the same breath and concisely articulated the main features as compiled by the research team and contributing writers. We are also very grateful to him assisting with the editing. Mr. Sir Calix, I remember you said, take this out. Put this in, primus, uh, 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 I don't want this though. This is how you have to go about it, and start red, red ink, red ink, red ink, red ink, red ink. <laughs> I, 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 at, at one time I said to myself, oh gosh, why did we invite <laughs> <laughs> But it all turned out for the better. Thank you so much, sir. Poet extraordinaire and very, our very own Kenesia Lubrin, who is supposed to have been here with us, um, distinctly and in true poetic style, is genuinely descriptive, painting in words the struggles and hardships, humiliation, resilience, the joy and victory, and the triumph of the spirit of the Bali people. In the introduction, our research team member, Ms. Patricia Lionel, outlined in brief overview, in a brief overview, the conceptualization of this project. Ms. Lionel articulated concisely how an idea metamorphosed into such a Herculean task that it took a team of researchers, a group of contributing writers, and a few benevolent experts in their own rights to complete this project successfully. The idea was born after the Jackwell community, one of four communities selected by the Mosinia Patrick Anthony Folk Research Center, FRC, to host UNE Coyol activities in observance of Coyol Heritage Month in 2016. The Rosa community first held this activity in 1997 and on both occasions successfully captured the national Lawen Koyal competition 
firstly by Miss Anne Lubre, popularly known as Miss Monica, and incidentally, two of her daughters contributed to the completion of this, of this book. However, you will need to read the book to know precisely their contributions. <laughs> the second lady to capture the crown, and she's here with us, was Angela Simon, a retired school teacher, better known as Ferrier, and that was in 2016. Give her a hand. <laughs> the early history of Rosa Valley is documented by historian Robert DeVoe, recounting the experiences of the European sailors and missionaries arriving at the Rosso Bay in the year 1700. Your humble servant attempted to summarize DeVoe's account, highlighting the early settlers occupying vast areas of land using slave labor to cultivate various crops, which include cocoa, sugarcane, on very arable soil. The settlers quickly expanded their cultivation from small farms to much larger ones. This resulted in the construction of a jetty at the Rosso Bay, and according to DeVoe, this initiative encouraged a number of ships to both thereby boosting a successful form of mercantilism. Long story short, a sugarcane sugar cane eventually became the viable crop. A sugarcane factory was established, and sugar, sugar became a major export commodity until it was no longer viable. Of course, DeVoe's account highlighted a number of issues, labor wars, discontentment, strike, uprising, and even deaths during that era. Devo noted that during the sugarcane era, the factory experimented with the brewing, brewing of an extra strong pure spirit drawn out of the sugarcane sugar juice. And in collaboration with the Barnards, owners of the Denry Valley Farms and factory produced the Denros Bonte Rome. Now, I don't know how many of you remember cock, what is that? Cock, cock, show cock, share something, the rum was so strong. Cock what? Cock shot, yeah. Um, most of you wouldn't remember that, but I was still a kid, but I, 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 I tried to experiment with it, and gosh. <laughs> anyway, well, there we are gathered today. Uh, where we are gathered today is testimony to how progressive it has been from the sugar factory days to a state-of-the-art, multiple, multiple award-winning company, the St. Lucia Distillers. They are indeed very grateful for this. Poco, 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 let me finish. We are indeed very grateful for the much needed support. So a round of applause for Mrs. Moplesi and a wonderful staff. As earlier indicated, I attempted to summarize Robert DeVoe's account of the Rosa Valley from a historical perspective in the first chapter and in subsequent chapters, attempting to refresh your memory on the experiences of those who toiled on the estate as recounted in reminiscences and delve into the social assessment of the Hollywood community where we are currently assembled. The Rosa Valley is replete with exciting, mind-blowing, scintillating activities, very poignant moments, rich history, and varying lifestyles, intrigue, suspense, and a heart-racing account of a domestic dispute resulting in a, gru resulting in a gruesome and brutal mother of a young, ravishing female resident of the valley will make the hair on your head stand at attention, and you really must read that. And a man was brutally murdered, who brutally murdered his brother on his farm. The deceased son's harrowing, uncensored account will undoubtedly shock you. That's another one you should read. The stories of Gage, larger bless, the hammock, hammock, you know, the hammock, that's what you used to carry the, the, the sick, to transport the sick miles from the humble domain through very dangerous terrain and tracks to receive medical attention. The early years of dancing and the advent of hi-fi music using battery power, of course, electricity was years away. It will interest you to know that many occurrences mishap, mistrust, mistrust and distrust at a time and the end results. Like Makaidi Sarko, y'all. Tasala, le nutikani amizma, moon tikasevi, shal, flabo, I think the flabo, the UW people around, you know what flabo is about? <laughs> flabo, anyway, just, I'm just joking. Flabo and so on. This, there's a building just across there on the right. That's, that's where the first set of dances took place. That's way back. Jigo, you wouldn't remember that. You were too young for that. <laughs> and um, the high fives, you know. Um, fellas used to carry the, 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 um, the soldering, whatever it was, you know, the makeshift thing, the technology at the time. And people used their flabos to go to the various uh, millet and. and, and, and La Comingo and these places to enjoy themselves. Okay. So, 
I was saying the early years, it's really interesting to know that many occurrences may have mistrust and distrust at the time and the end results. The rituals of the dead, superstitions, how the farm shy, local midwife, and the pensée, local, local masseuse or healer, were revered. Okay, the, the court and the solo era and the other popular cultural practices. The arranged combats among the champions, fighters, known as uh, in Creole as the Billy, and I'll read an excerpt from that in a moment. All of these and more are captured in the chapters, the Roseau Valley um, Culture, Folklore and Recreation, and Bad and Jack Bell Senior Citizens speak respectively. The senior citizens of Bad and Jack Bell, some have since transitioned, shared their early life experiences in senior citizens speak, and the Indian settlement is in focus as well, charting the arrival their arrival in St. Lucia as indentured laborers and subsequently settling in selected communities on island. The community of Mont Ciseau in the Roseau Valley, which we highlighted, is a prominent fixture in that equation. The story of bananas in the valley is comprehensively captured in Francis Lewis's account. All you needed to know about the banana industry in the valley is revealed in a complete historical overview. Our project would not have been complete without the vital input of the contributing writers. Mr. Francis Leos, a member of the research team, related the entire history of the banana industry from inception to its current situation. Stanislaus Albert, current chairperson of the Mont Sizu Baden Mondo Jackmail Development Committee, a youth activist and a prominent official of the Church of the Holy Family, Batol Iglesias, um, provided a historical overview of the Rosa Common School and the Church of the Holy Family. Former school principal of the Rosa Combined School, Brian August, recounted the myriad of challenges which confronted him and the unenviable task he was also saddled with and how he was also was able to successfully navigate that not easy road. Then the parish priest, Father Lambert St. Rose, and there was so much we could have said about Father, that, we, we, that would take us the entire night into tomorrow. Father Lambert St. Rose was heavily with us today his theological perspectives list with poetic and symbolic expressions captured in the cultural, socio-economic, anthropological, and spiritual experiences of the Rosu people in his enthralling contribution entitled Footprints in the Valley. Stanislaus Al Albert, Margaret Lubin Ayoki, I, I hope I got this one right, Patricia Landell, and your humble servant, all sons and, and daughters of Rosu, collaborated on the 12th chapter to highlight the progress made in youth and sports development. The chapter entitled Recent Developments by Ms. Lionel provides a vivid, a vivid perspective on the major achievements in the Valley. She elaborated on the many strides made in recent times, among them the hosting of Junior Coyol on two occasions successfully, and the cream of the crop jazz festivals at Masque Plateau overlooking the Rosa Bay. A round, of, a round of applause. I mean, this was very successful. Thanks to Ms. Lionel and the others. The many significant contributions made by the Rosa people of all walks of life, those still alive and those gone before us, those gone before us, um, cannot be overemphasized. Therefore, in our last chapter, Mr. Arnell and I, after much deliberation, gave honorable mention to the most prominent members of the community and the sterling contributions over the years. In this chapter, we will be, you will be introduced to the rural healer, per se, the storyteller, the midwife, the farm shy, the farmer, the housewife, geriatric athlete, female, the geriatric, geriatric fem athlete, female, at the, who won medals both locally and nationally, and those in academia and varying professionals, the cultural icons, musicians, among so many others. We have missed a few, but too many to mention, and so our sincere apologies to those we failed to mention. Trust me, the task was a daunting one. It would be remiss of me not to mention this gentleman who was part of the editing team, but also volunteered to write the postscript, and is here today to deliver the vote of thanks, Monsieur Olguske. Let me express our sincere gratitude for your selfless approach. <laughs> and other members of the team to see this project to its completion. I don't think it is wise to allow you, Mr. Busquet, to blow your own trumpet while delivering the vote of thanks, so I'm doing it right now. <laughs> Mr. Lionel, I know you will get your flowers, but the painstaking task you undertook voluntarily, voluntarily to, assist, to ascertain all were in order, and finally perusing the copy from Amazon 
and praise God you did, cannot be over, cannot be overemphasized. A round of applause for her, please. And this, ladies and gentlemen, this was a sneak preview of the stories of Russell Valley. Thank you so much. Now I have been asked to read an excerpt from the book. Um, at the last moment I was asked to do this. Um, the excerpt is an account of a very poignant experience um, considering, considering that it may have been the very first um, murder, recorded murder in the Rizzo Valley. And this seems to have evoked national outcry. Richard Gregg, also known as Chedo now deceased, a master storyteller, also, and also one of the uh, custodians of our oral tradition, recounted this heart-wrenching story during an exclusive, which was truly in preparation for Juni Koyal celebration in 1997 in Jackpot. So bear with me, and let's see how this goes. Greg described the Hollywood community in Ruzu on payday as similar to a carnival activity. Although there were separate uh, payday's, for example, Friday afternoons for workers assigned to sub-communities like Mondo, Vana, Peru, and La Pelle, the big payday was Saturday. Scores of merchants from around the island, but the majority from Castries, converged on Hollywood, Hollywood Rosso right here, on a Saturday to, play the, to ply the trades. Among them were also the ladies of the night. I don't think you all wanted to explain what this means. Um, but Hollywood was also transformed into a local casino, casino, with some men gambled, some men gambled away the entire weekly earnings, often leading to a serious, to serious brawls and injuries at the gambling place as well as home. It soon became a notorious gangster paradise, not gangsters with firearms, but men who settled grudges with the fist. Occasionally, cutlasses would also be used. Fist fights were the order of the day, and particularly on a payday. One would hear the sipsio, the rumors, of arranged duels to take place just before dusk. The highly anticipated combats were in, in prearranged venues with lots of spectators placing bets. Greg recalled that even the police dreaded Hollywood on a Saturday. He described one such duel as a short fight to the death, involving two of the notorious Bélier, the Coyol sob sob sobriquet for ferocious gangsters. Um, the two both, the two, both of heavy physical strength, but the feared Joma from Monsizo and the merciless Donnelly from Rosso. The crowd feared that this feud would surely have ended with one dead and tried to dissuade them to avert a fatality. After much persuasion, the fight was averted. But in preparation for the much anticipated battle, it was alleged that Donnelly had girded his loins with a lady's headscarf and had rubbed both fists with an unknown ointment. However, the cancellation of the duel brought an, expect, an unexpected twist to the scenario. It is alleged that Donnelly walked to a huge prominent tree in the community and using one fist, hit it a fierce blow that resulted in the immediate demise of the tree. Everyone present was astonished to see minutes later, leaves began to wilt, began wilting and falling off the branches. One week later, the tree was dead. In the quick. I would now like to call on, on behalf of Mr. Francis Leos, who is also a member of our team. Unfortunately, he could not be here with us today. I know he's at home watching. Hi, Mr. Leos. I would like to call on Ms. Joanne Cooper, his daughter, to do the tribute to Dr. Joseph Edsel Edmonds. Please welcome Ms. Cooper. Thank you. We take the opportunity of this gathering for the launch of the book, Stories of Roseau Valley, to pay tribute to Dr. Edsel Edmonds, who established a regional and international professional reputation whilst based in this very valley as the head of Winban Research. Dr. Edmonds died on the 21st of July in the USA where he had served as St. Lucia's ambassador to the USA and OAS, followed by several years of other diplomatic service. 
he continued to live in the U.S. after his retirement. Dr. Edmonds first joined Windman Research as a nematologist, researching the control of nematode disease, which was plaguing the banana production. The research center was established and financed through Mr. John Van Geest, who owned the Geest Estates in the Roseau Valley. Dr. Edmonds eventually became the director of the research center. During his tenure with Windman Research, Dr. Edmonds attained international prominence, first as a nematologist, and then became well known in the region for his mission to extend the other areas of technological services of the research center in order to, contrib to, contrib to contribute to the improvement of the banana industry overall. Mr. S Sir Calix George um, actually mentioned, alluded to that earlier on. The high yield levels which were successfully experienced in the St. Lucia Model Farms Initiative in this valley was a direct result of strict adherence to the Windman Research recommendations by Dr. Edmonds and his colleagues of the Research Center. The launch of this book, which will sensitize people to the cultural and social aspects of the Rosa Valley, will hopefully also bring into focus the potential for a planned agricultural scheme incorporating the positive experience of the St. Lucia model farms. Again, Sir Calix George mentioned that in his remarks earlier. May Dr. Edmund's memory serve to cause the development of a national policy for the economic development of the Rosa Valley with the utilization of the nearby still standing and unused research center building serving as a catalyst to this. We thank him for his contribution and may he rest in eternal peace. Distinguished guests, authors, and cherished members of the Roseau Valley community, good afternoon. It is with great pleasure I stand before you today on behalf of St. Lucia Distillers to celebrate the launch of Stories of Roseau Valley. Based on what I have been told, I plan to buy my copies this afternoon. <laughs> this book is a testament to the rich history, vibrant culture, and resilient spirit of the Roseau Valley, a place that we at St. Lucia Distillers have proudly called home since 1972. Firstly, I would like to extend our heartfelt congratulations to the remarkable authors of this book. Your collaboration on this project is a shining example of the community spirit that thrives in Roseau, where neighbors truly look out for one another. In my 30 plus years of working within this community, I continue to be amazed by the strong bonds that tie this community together, bonds that are increasingly rare in many parts of St. Lucia. St. Lucia de Stellas is honored to be part of this special event and to have had the opportunity to support this initiative. Over the years, we have not only contributed to the economic development of the community by being a major employer, but we have also supported initiatives in education and other areas vital to the well-being of this community. We are here to stay. And our commitment to the Roseau Valley is unwavering. In fact, our ambitious investment plans for the, in, for the coming years will transform this valley. And it is crucial that our history and the history of the valley is meticulously documented. Our involvement in this project is especially meaningful to us because we understand the importance of preserving history. On 2nd of May, 2007, St. Lucia Distillers faced a devastating fire that resulted in the loss of all our historical records. While we had computerized our financial information, 
we had not yet digitized our historical documents. This loss was deeply felt and it underscored for us the critical importance of documenting and preserving our past. Recently, while conducting research for a geographical indication, for a geographical indication application for St. Lucia Rum, you will see it, it's in the Gazette right now, we struggled to find specific information about St. Lucia distillers. This experience certainly brought home to us, once again, the value of preserving history. And of course, we did not hesitate when the opportunity arose to assist in documenting the history of the Roseau Valley, our home. I would like to encourage everyone who is able to do so to purchase a copy of the book. In, do in doing so, you are not only supporting the authors and their work, but you are also helping to preserve the rich history of the Roseau Valley for future generations. Thank you once again to the authors for your dedication and to everyone here for your support of this important project. Let us continue to celebrate and document the stories of our community, ensuring that they are not lost to time, but are instead passed down as a cherished legacy. Thank you. I would now like to proceed by calling on Mr. Melcher Henry from the Folk Research Center to deliver some additional remarks. Please welcome Mr. Henry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me to adopt the protocol that has been established. Um, when we got a call from the group which produced the story of Rosa Valley, we immediately decided that we had to be part of this, this project and provide the support that they, they had asked us to, to provide. Um, we ourselves, co Research Center, as the name implies, is a research organization. Unfortunately, like the Stillers, in 2018, there was a fire at Folk Research Center and we lost 40 years of records. Um, so we, are, we, were able, we were able to preserve some that we had stored in other locations, but we are at a stage now where we are beginning to rebuild. Okay? Um, it is important for us to, to document our history so that we can pass on the knowledge uh, to our, our, young, our young ones. Um, when I was growing up, I attended the RC Boys Primary School. And I remember they, were, they taught history, um, but the history that I learned, there was nothing about St. Lucia. There was nothing about St. Lucia. I learned everything about the Moran Bay Rising. It was an inspiring story about the Maroons in Jamaica. Um, but I never learned about Marion Padre in St. Lucia. There was nothing about our own brigands in St. Lucia. So this effort, um, plus the effort of others, we have a, there's a saying that St. Lucia is not a, St. Lucia is not a, uh, a, a research oriented, we don't have a culture of research. So I'm hoping that we can begin to, to change this. Uh, by documenting our history and we can encourage other communities to do the same. I haven't read the book from cover to cover, but I selected certain stories. And one of them that I, I went for from the very beginning was the one on the model farms. And the reason for this is because I worked with the Banana Association for 14 years. So I know something about model farms. And I wanted to see if they had, if they had captured the significance of the con economic contribution that Rosa Valley had made to St. Lucia. I wanted to see it because I was going to mention it if that had been, been missed, but I think Mr. Leos captured it. But then I want to give you a statistic that will tell you how significant it was. And the reason why I can do this is because I was the one extracting the data from the database. So I know. Okay? Um, model farms in a fortnight produce the equivalent of Grenada's annual production. That's how significant it was. Um, now, one of the things that has been mentioned about the book is that this is just a beginning. And that's the impression I got from reading some of the stories that I've read. Um, and even with respect to model farms, 
there is more that need to, needs to be looked at. For instance, following the demise of model farms, what has been the social and economic impact on the lives of the people in Rosso Valley and environs? Okay, these are some of the things that need to be looked at. And um, there are lots of accounts in the book, but it needs to go a little further and analyze the social impact, what it really means, and so forth. Um, but I think it's a, it's a commendable effort, and uh, Folk Research Center congratulates you, congratulates you on the production of the, of the book, and we hope that there will be a revised edition or a part two or something of that sort. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Allow me to adopt the protocol that has been established. Um, I must say that it's an honor for myself and my family to be here. I want to say a big thank you to Patrish and the team. You have done a remarkable job. A lot of the stories that you have told mirrored some of the stories my mom told me growing up during the Geist era, etc. So that was a fantastic job done. Um, I want to say that this book personally was a very big eye opener for myself. Um, it grounded my understanding of who I am as a person, why I became an entrepreneur. I think that Joe Wuzu inherently tend to be rebellious, tend to not accept what is given to them. We are go-getters, we are hustlers, we will go out and make it happen. And I always thought that was just intrinsic, but learning about these stories, I realized, wow, this is from the ancestors. This, is, this goes way beyond just myself. And, um, I just want to say that it, it really, again, confirmed some of the stuff that my mom said to me and made me realize that we truly are pretty much Joe Wuzu in, in, every, in every sense of the word. But today, I want my remarks to be about destiny. Because as I read through the book, there was one theme that sort of stood out to me and I wanted to highlight it. And the one thing that stood out to me was that the people of the Roseau Valley, for the most part, we have always been adapting to external forces. Sugarcane, bananas, now tourism. But we have not generally created industries of scale ourselves. We have always been surviving and reacting to external. And why do I say that? That's something that I'm proud to be changing as a Joe Uzo, that we can create an industry internationally from Sargassum Seaweed that has moved from St. Lucia to Miami to Europe, that a Jawozo can move from just having things happening around them to creating industries. And I think that's the next step for our young people coming up, not just looking for a job, not just fitting into what's happening around us, but how can we become creators? But it didn't start with me, it started with my mother, and I wanted to highlight that story that she shared with me before I jump off. So my mother, when she was very young, for those of you who may not know, she was the principal of the Marigo Secondary School, this is a real Joe Ozo story. So my mother, when she was about 13 years old, she got funds to go to Martinique to be a house servant for a lady called Madame Jaloui. She was a French aristocrat. And being a true Joe Ozo, she found that Madame Jaloui was being too overbearing one day. And she said to her in Creole, as a 13-year-old poor girl, uneducated, my mother said to her, I'm going to go to university. A little girl who came from right there said to this woman, I am not going to be your servant forever. I'm going to go to university. And Madame Jaloui, recognizing that she was a Jawozo, reported my mother to her daughter, who then got my mother into the University of the Southern Caribbean in Trinidad. So I just want to share that story that our destiny moving forward is in our hands. We cannot depend on anybody else outside. As Joe Ozo, we have to look for opportunities for ourselves and create opportunities for ourselves. And rather than reacting to what the world throws at us, it's time for us to become the creators. Um, I will end by saying that I think that my parents really instilled in me and my brother um, from their own experiences a desire to shape our own destiny, not to be victims of external circumstances. And I just want to say that, in conclusion, that all of what we've been able to achieve as a company, as a family, um, I wish more of it was in St. Lucia, but that's, that's one of the story. But even internationally, I want to share with everybody that your dreams as Joe Ozo, your dreams, your visions, they are yours to make true. Do not sit and wait for anybody to come and make it happen for you. You make it happen for yourself. And I know from our history, we can do that.
I'm an example of it. And I pray that in the years to come, there will be many, many other Joe's. That book will have to be filled with so You need to have like 10 chapters. That's who's coming up now. It's not just murder and crime. You have determined, driven people here who have a vision for the future that they're going to make a reality. So I just want to share that with everybody. Thank you. And it's a total honor and pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Margaret Lubrin Aoki here, Maggie. And I bring you warm greetings from Tokyo. Although I can't be with you in person today, however, my heart is busting with immense gratitude, pride, and excitement for the launch of our book, Stories of Rosa Valley. I'm thrilled because this is more than a book launch. It's an extraordinary celebration of our community's journey, our resilience, and our spirit told by some of the very people who have made it what it is today. Well, let me express some thanks, some, some gratitude quickly. First and foremost, I want to extend my deepest gratitude to the publisher and editor, um, Rosa Valley Press and Jaco Books for believing in our vision and providing guidance through this transformative journey. For indeed it has been, your expertise and guidance have been invaluable. I also want to thank our families and well-wishers for the incredible patience and encouragement and desired support. <laughs> thank you for enthusiasm about this book. Without your support and cooperation, this book would not have been possible. Now, you may recall when the Jack Mel Junior Quill Committee embarked on this journey, um, the singular vision was to produce a booklet but the idea transformed and took on a life of its own. And as we captured the heart and soul of our community, we became enthusiastic about documenting our rich history, our struggles, and our triumphs. And why not? They're worth documenting. As these stories are the bedrock of our identity and the root of our collective strength. Undoubtedly, Stories of Rosa Valley is the result of love, and an extraordinary collaborative effort. Countless hours of discussions, passionate discussions that is. I remember clearly <laughs> some meticulous research and thoughtful revision, emails, messages have gone into its creation. Each of us brought our unique perspectives and strengths to this project, and I am immensely proud of the synergy we have achieved. Together, we have created a truly marvelous read. Writings we hope will resonate deeply with you, the readers, and ignite meaningful conversations. Well, to speak of individual contributions. For my part, I focused on early childhood education, care and development, and youth and community development as well. This journey was deeply personal and enriching for me because triangulating my memory and jolting my memory meant reaching out and reuniting with some folks and some old friends whom I had not conversed with in a long time. The nostalgia from reminiscing about the past during the wee hours of the morning due to the time difference made this experience as rewarding as it was challenging. Well, to everyone witnessing this book launch today, I would like to speak directly to you. This book is not just a collection of stories. It is a powerful testament of our community's indomitable spirit and resilience. Therefore, owning a copy of Stories of Rosa Valley means holding a piece of our collective heritage in your hands. I urge you to read it, cherish it, own it, and share it with others. Share it with your children, your grandchildren, nieces and nephews, friends. Everyone should get to read this. Let it remind you of our shared history and inspire you to contribute to the ongoing story of our community. So, let me be the one to tell you that this is just the beginning. 
my dear friends. Our journey does not end here. We have so many more stories to uncover, so many more voices to hear, and so much more history to document. I look forward to continuing this incredible journey with all of you. Our history is rich, diverse, and profoundly important. We must preserve it for future generations and use it as a foundation to build on an even brighter future. So thank you all for being here today and for your unwavering support. Please enjoy this wonderful celebration of our shared history and let us move forward in unity with renewed energy and purpose. Get the book. Hello everybody, thank you for having us. I have my two beautiful daughters with me, Alexi and Shari. They're popping in to say hello and to extend their gratitude for the recognition of me in that case, but also to underscore the importance, I believe, that permeates professional growth, that permeates personal growth, is the importance of family. And this is something that I take very, very seriously, and I think is so, so important to all of us. So they're just saying hi, and they will be exiting the video shortly. And we just want to say thank you to the organizing committee in the first instance. And they're saying, bye. bye. <laughs> I appreciate the fact that I have been identified as one of the individuals to be part of this initiative. Unfortunately, I cannot be with you there physically. I would have so wished that that would have been the case. But still, I extend my very, very best for successful activity, which simply speaks to the importance of a supportive network, the importance of a positive network, the importance of looking out for each other, the importance of the values that we learned and we must pass on to the younger generation, that sense of community. I know that a lot of work has gone into this initiative, but here's what, with the hard work, we can sit now and appreciate that it has come to a completion in the first instance, because I dare say such initiatives should continue because as we go along, Many of our people are doing well in all fairs of life. It doesn't have to only be, you know, in the blue collar. You know, we have our excellent farmers. We have our excellent bus drivers. We have excellent community activists. Our excellent journalists. You know, there's so much happening for us in the Roseau Valley, in the Roseau area, that we need to recognize this. Many of you would have known that I am a product of the Roseau RC Combined School. This is where I got my initial education. And for that, I know that throughout my life, it has been a significant part of my success. I reflect on the great times we had with the sports meet, with the activities, with the creative elements. Roseau was buzzing. The Jackman area, the Marigo area, the environs were buzzing with a sense of community, with our mothers, you know, coming on stream with our catechist, you know, with our parish, parish of the Holy Family. And so that contributed to the development of so many of us that we can stand back and say, there's been some level of success. But that success does not mean that we stay stagnant. That success doesn't mean that we get to the point where we say, oh, well, I've got this and I've got that. I've done this so I can remain stagnant. We are a community of lifelong learners, of individuals who believe in development. And so my plea to you is to continue. And as long as I'm physically able, mentally able, I will be part of the next steps to ensure that, in, that this initiative continues. I am Fiona Maya Sengis, just thanking you for that recognition, encouraging all of our young ones to keep at it. To keep at it, keep at the positive values that speak to who we are as an individual. We're not less than, yeah? We're not less than anybody. We have done great things and we will continue to do great things. Let me wish everybody on the committee, let me wish other individuals being recognized, let me wish our sponsors, our donors, 
yeah, our benefactors, all are the very best, as I continue to say. Yeah. We are a people of greatness, but we must recognize it and we must applaud it in each other, regardless of the area that we find ourselves excelling at. All the very best to you as I extend my gratitude once more. I thank you. Please allow me to, to say a special good afternoon to Sir Calix Judge, um, Monsignor um, Anthony, Father Lambert and Rose, the Dujo family, um, uh, your mother, I know your, you, you know your wife and I had a very good, very good relationship. And good afternoon to, to everyone. Thank you for, for being here today. It is with great pleasure and excitement that I welcome you to the launch of the new book, Stories of the Rosa Valley. This book is more than just a collection of tales. It is a tapestry of lives, traditions, and memories that have shaped the heart and soul of our community. Each story within these pages is a reflection of the spirit and resilience of the people who have lived, loved, and persevered in this community. The idea of Stories of the Rosa Valley was born out of a desire to capture the essence of our villages, our valley's unique history. It is a world that, in a, in a world that is rapidly changing, it is important to remember and cherish the narratives that connect us to our past and each other. This book is a tribute to the countless voices that have contributed to the rich mosaic of our heritage. I would like to extend my greatest gratitude to the authors who have poured their hearts and soul into these stories. Your dedication and passion are evident in every word, and it is through our efforts that the legacy of our community will, comp will continue to inspire future generations. A special thanks also goes out to the editorial team who have worked tirelessly to bring this project to fruition. Your attention to detail and commitment to excellence has ensured that the stories of the Rosa Valley is not just a book, but a treasure trove of memories. To our readers, both present and future, I hope this book will invoke a sense of nostalgia and pride. May it remind you of the simple joys of our valley, of our valley life, and the deep connections that bind us together as a community. I encourage you to share these stories with your children and grandchildren so that the traditions and values of our community may live on. Finally, I'd like to express my appreciation to everyone who supported this project whether through contributions, encouragement, or simply by believing in the importance of preserving our history. Your support has been invaluable, and this book launch would not have, would not have been possible without you. As we celebrate the release of our stories of the Rosa Valley, let us remember that each of us has a story to tell. Let us continue to share our experience and keep the spirit of our village alive for generations to come. Thank you very much. And please purchase as many books as possible. I thank you. We never knew the amount of work that it would have taken to extract all of these stories. Yes, we were excited about this project, but delving deep into the information that we had to pull out, we went through so many challenging times. And I know we may have left out some information, I know we may not have expounded on some of the things that we probably should have written more about, but there is more to come. I also want to encourage or to reach out to, to call out to the other members of the community, not just in Jack Mel, but we're calling on Monsizo, we're calling on Rozo, we're calling on Marigo, Kulita, Millet, Dewado, Tetshime, to bring out those stories. We know there is a lot to offer. We know there is so much more that we can offer the world. And we have launched this book but I know there will be more to come. And when we call out to you, please, please answer our call. So with that being said, I think we have reached the end of the proceedings.